Before we jump into the text, uh, one thing I do want to talk about, and I've talked about this plenty, uh, what is love? Uh, is love a, a feeling? Is love uh, an affection? Is love an emotion? Is love something you do? Is love something you are? The answer is yes. Right? Love, love is all of those things. That is something you see in Scripture. It's, not, it's never just one of those things. Um, a lot of times people talk about love, especially today, as love is affirmation. And certainly, affirmation has a lot to do with what it means to love, but it's not just affirmation. Love is a feeling, it's an affection, it's an emotion, it's something you do, but love is also something we should be. And that is something I think you'll see in the text today. And so kind of just to give a lead up to the text as a sort of quick review, in the first letter of John, uh, so far, what he has said is, hey, we proclaim Jesus so that you may have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And you know you have fellowship. Uh, you connect. You have fellowship. You have communion with the Father and Son by confessing and so being cleansed. And you can know that you are connected. You can know that you have fellowship. You can know that you have been cleansed if you are keeping his commandments, right? He doesn't say that as we've talked about uh, in the context of the letter of John. He's not saying that this is evidence uh, that you keep his commandments and you'll always do it perfectly. No, but that you're in a progress of purification, that you're progressing in regards to commandment keeping. And this is something I want to emphasize because I want to be clear on this. I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea that I'm talking about a works-based salvation or anything like that. Commandment keeping is not a means to justification. Commandment keeping is not a means to salvation. Commandment keeping is not means to connection to God. It is a result of our connection to God. That is something we see in Scripture. But what commandments, what commandment is he talking about, as I've already made clear uh, and just made it <laughs> obvious, love? What commandment is primarily being talked about? It is love. First John chapter 2, verse 5. He says, as we read last week, but whoever keeps his word, his message, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in Him. Love. Love is the commandment we're talking about. This has always been the primary focus of God's commandments. Love. Nothing new. Nothing new. As he says in verse 7, we skip ahead a little bit, 1 John chapter 2, verse 7, Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. You know about this. You've heard this time and time again, and he's possibly referring all the way back to the Old Testament, such as Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. We also read in Leviticus 19, verse 18, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Nothing new. It was always the primary teaching in regards to commandments in the Old Testament. And of course, Jesus reiterates this in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. It says, Teacher, which is the great commandment or the, the primary commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And we also read in the Gospel of John recently, John chapter 13, verse 34, and John 15, verse 12, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So it's clear. Right? Jesus has brought out the, the most important commandment, and in a way, he made it anew. 
anew. And how and why did he make it anew? I want you to think about this. Consider this for a second. I think in large part he makes this commandment new because people practice the commandments at the expense of love. People practice and still do practice commandments at the expense of love. Commandment keeping became self-centered. It was about making sure that I looked good uh, before others at the expense of loving God and loving others. Commandment keeping was not about loving the Lord, but trying to get something from the Lord. Commandment keeping was not about praising God, but about trying to get praise for oneself. You see, this was a problem then. This is a problem even today. Uh, There are a lot of people who practice commandments not because they love God, but because they want something from God. They practice commandments not because they want to give praise to God, but because they want to receive praise from others. And again, this is something that Jesus addressed, and I can't remember exactly where it is. I don't have it in the notes or the slides. But Jesus talks directly to the teachers, uh, the Pharisees, saying, that, hey, uh, you practice commandments because you want praise from men. That's, that's why you practice these commandments. That's why you follow the law. Commandment-keeping became self-centered. It was never about love. People practice commandments at the expense of love. And so Jesus, he enters this scene. He takes this old commandment, and he makes it new, I think, because people had the wrong focus. They had the wrong motive. We'll continue to see this. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 8. What is, what is the right understanding? How, how should we understand love? How is love going to be properly practiced if it's not going to be practiced out of selfish ambition. How is this even going to happen? How do we even love as we ought? 1 John chapter 2, verse 8. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. You see, this old commandment, it's not just old, it's also new, because not just because Jesus puts emphasis on it, when you think about it, Jesus, he changed, he changed the very makeup of the world. He changed our environment, and he changed our spiritual state. Right before, before Jesus came into the world as light, we could not have hoped to have loved as we ought. We could not have hoped to follow this command as we ought. Yet Jesus, he comes into the world as light and expels the darkness. I'm going to pause here for just a second. I need you to pay close attention to this verse and what is it exactly saying. Slowly, it says, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you. This commandment to love, it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him. Who's him? Jesus. It's true in him and in you. Why is it new? How is it? Or why, why? It's in him, but it's also in us. Why? Second half of that verse, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. You see, Jesus, who is light, came into the world, cast out the darkness that we lived in and also the darkness that existed within us. He's the reason that this commandment to love is in us. It's a very key word in. Back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. I want you to notice this because this has always been the plan. Always been the plan. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I might have to flip to it. I don't know if I can read that from there. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on or in your heart. 
You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Specifically, verse 6, notice what that says. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart or in your heart. And I've talked about the heart before. What is the heart? They have this understanding that the heart, it's not this, but it's the place of of feeling, of affection, of your will, of your desire for love to be in you, to pervade the the innermost part of you, your, your desires, your affections, your will. That is what God so desires. He wants love to be there. For love not to be just something you do. Love is not just something you do. God wants love to be who you are. Hence why he wants it in in you. To be in your heart. To pervade everything that is about you, your innermost being. Love is there. It's not just something you do, it's something, it's something you are. There has been a change in us because Jesus brought a change to the world. We, we see this. I'm going to go back there again. I've read this text many times, but 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, we see that when Jesus enters the scene, there's a change to the world and there's a change to us. First uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things are made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verses 9, and we'll skip to verses 12 and 13. The true light which gives light to everyone, that is Jesus, was coming into the world, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become or to be born children of God, who were not born, uh, not, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So you notice the change that occurs, because light has come into the world, you believe the light, there's a change to you, you are born... You are born a child of God. You are born of God's will. Not born of sinful flesh, not born of the will of man, but born of and according to God's will. Because light came into the world, there is a change to us. Love, love is a new commandment because we have been so enabled by Jesus to love as we ought because he enlightens the world. And if Jesus did not enter the world, If Jesus did not enter the world as light, we would all still be in darkness, and darkness would still be in us. We would not see how to love. We would not know how to love. And I think this is something that a lot of people take for granted and don't even realize, uh, both sometimes believers and and non-believers. Sometimes believers rely way too much on their own power uh, and think that they accomplish Uh, commandment keeping or or, or sanctification or salvation on their own, but there's also a sense in which there's a lot of non-believers who who get this idea that (laughs) they know what love is apart from God. (laughs) That does not happen. And I don't think people realize this. They take for granted what, what Jesus did, how he came into the world, what he did, how he loved us, and how that changed the world. Without Jesus, we we don't know how to love. Without God, we don't know how to love. Without God, love is just some subjective choice that has no real meaning. So no, without God, without Christ, people, people don't even know what love is. People don't even know what love is, and they don't realize this, and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Uh, John chapter 12 John chapter 12, just to illustrate, hey, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even see how to love. We wouldn't know what to do. John chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. I'm going to flip there because I, I can't read that myself right now. Uh, that's not good. <laughs> I used to be able to. John chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. <clears throat> 
It says, so Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that, may, that you may become sons of the light. And verse 46 says, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Right, that's where we're at apart from Jesus. We're stuck in darkness. We don't know where to go. And I would add to that, we don't know how to love. We don't know what love is. We don't know how to love if we are in darkness. 1 John chapter 2, back to verse 9. He says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Now, this should really go without saying, but just because someone says something is true does not make it true. Some people might say, hey, um, I believe, but evidently they don't. There, there, there's no fruit there. Because as a result of true faith and true trust in Christ, there's fruit. Some people say they believe, but they really don't. And just because some people say they are a child of God and a child of light does not make it so. Again, just because you say something does not make it slow. so. And one clear indicator, one clear indica indicator that somebody is not in the light, a child of God, if they hate their brother. If you hate your brother. And what does he mean by brother? Well, that, that word, of course, can mean <laughs> what you probably would think it means a sibling that's a brother. Uh, but it can also be taken in Scripture to mean a fellow believer, a fellow Christian, a fellow disciple of Christ, a brother. And in this case, I think he refers to a fellow believer, point being the context, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, he says, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. So one thing you see in this letter, that he, he refers to fellow believers as brothers. So, if you hate your fellow born-again children of God, that is a clear indicator that someone, that you could be still in darkness. And as we continue, this is something that John, he's going to talk a lot about loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. And one thing that should be obvious, I shouldn't have to say this, but he's going to write about you know, loving our fellow believers it's not meant to be taken as, okay, just as long as I love my fellow believers, I can then hate non-believers. No, <laughs> that's not what he's saying. Just because he focuses on our love for our brothers or sisters in Christ does not give warrant for hating non-believers. I shouldn't have to say that, but I felt like I needed to. Uh, Jesus himself, of course, teaches in Matthew chapter 5, it's not in the slides, uh, that if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Right? Do not even the tax collectors and the Pharisees do the same? Right? You should love those who persecute you and, uh, or love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's what that says, right? So no, John is not teaching that, hey, just as long as you love your fellow believers, you're good. You can hate non-believers. No, that's not what he's saying. But I think there's a good reason that he focuses on our love for our fellow Christian. Think about this. If we can't even love our fellow Christian, if we can't even love our fellow brother or sister in Christ, how could we ever love our enemies? You could never. If you can't even love those who love you, how could you ever even get to the point that Jesus wants you to get, which is loving your enemies? You could never. If you can't love those who love you, you could never love your enemies. Never. We continue, verse 10 here. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. We are in the light if we love our fellow Christian, and in us there is no cause for stumbling. Now, that's an interesting phrase. It could be translated, is there no cause for sinning? Now, obviously, if you're hating someone, there is cause for sinning, because often, so often, I mean, hate itself is sinful, but so often in hate, people commit all sorts of sin. So there's no cause for sinning if we love our brothers, but it's interesting that this no cause for stumbling is the Greek word scandalone. What does that sound like? Scandal. That's where we get our word scandal from. If we love our brothers and sisters, there is no scandal. Now tell me, Tell me, how many scandals 
How many scandals have come out in the church because fellow Christians were not loving their fellow Christians? So many. And this is just such a sad and unfortunate result of sin and darkness, but so many scandals have plagued congregations, broken them, because people were not loving their fellow Christians. It breaks my heart. And I know, I know that a lot of you know what that looks like. So many people have caused so much pain, so much suffering, because they didn't even love their fellow believers. I mean, you can think of any number of scandal that's come out because of this. Any church, the Catholic Church obviously has struggled with this. Uh, Southern Baptist Convention has struggled with this. Um, there's a lot of big-name theologians that have come out and, boom, scandal. They weren't loving their fellow Christian. It is an unfortunate thing. It's a sad thing. It ruins a lot of churches. It does. Verse 11, whatever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Notice that strong emphasis, right? They're in darkness, walk in darkness, does not know where they're going, if it wasn't already clear, because darkness has blinded their eyes. That's the spiritual state of everybody apart from Christ. That is the spiritual state. They don't know where they're going, they don't know what they're doing, they don't know what love is. And remember, when we truly believe When we trust Christ, there is a change in us. When we dwell with him and he dwells with us, we end up loving as he loves. So to illustrate this back to the Gospel of John, again, a lot of connections exist between this letter and the Gospel of John. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And then skip to John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5 and 8. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. I've made this connection before, but I want you to notice this again. He says, if we love one another, we prove to be his disciples. Or rather, all will know we are his disciples. If we bear fruit, we prove to be his disciples. Do you get the sense that those things are synonymous? Loving, you see, is so much to do, has so much to do with what it means to bear fruit. And guess what? Where does fruit come from? How how is fruit born? By abiding in the vine. And who's the vine? Jesus. And so to bear this fruit of love, to bear this love that he has loved us with, we must dwell with him, be present with him, be connected to him. Again, when we receive Jesus, when we believe Jesus, when we trust Jesus, there's a change in us, and we're able to love as he loves. Back to 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. I'm going to pause for a second. These verses seem to be an exhortation. John, he takes a moment to, uh, it kind of seems like he wants to give his readers confidence As I mentioned last week, John, he does not write this letter to make them feel all anxious about sinning. You better watch out. You better not sin. That's not why he writes this. He writes this to give them confidence in God who cleanses them and God who changes them. And here he mentions 
children, young men and fathers, and most commentators agree that these titles, children, young men and fathers, seem to be in reference to where someone is spiritually. So a child in the faith spiritually, or a young man in the faith spiritually, or a father in the faith spiritually. So with that in mind, John chapter, or 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, going slowly, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. So if he's talking about little children here, according to spiritual standing, Say they're a young child of God. They, they came to faith recently. Maybe it's only a few years. He emphasizes your sins are forgiven for his, uh, for his name's sake. Now, a young Christian, that's what they need to hear. Mainly, primarily, that's what they need to hear. Your sins are forgiven. What they don't need to hear is, hey, look at those mature Christians over there. You better hurry up and become like them. No, what a young child of God needs to hear is that, hey, your sins are forgiven. That's what they need to hear. Verse 13, I'm writing to you fathers. So fathers, maybe he's referring to more mature people in the faith who've been in the faith for a long time, or maybe they just matured more quickly. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you children because you know the father. So he writes to the fathers, he says, because you know him who is from the beginning. Now, uh, I could probably imagine that some people who've been in faith a long time, there comes a point where sometimes you might struggle. Sometimes you wonder if, hey, am I really progressing in regards to sanctification and knowing God? And he wants to encourage these fathers. Maybe they're struggling with understanding that they've made progress. He says, no, you have. You have. And he says to the young men, because you have overcome the evil one, young men. So maybe they're four or five years into the faith that they've grown a little bit, but they're still struggling, so they're discouraged by their struggle. And he says, no, you've overcome the evil one. He gives them that encouragement because that's what they need to hear as Christians who probably still struggle a good bit. And he says, I write to you children because you know the Father. Verse 14, I write to you fathers because you know him who's from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. You have overcome the evil one. All right, he writes this to encourage his audience. And notice that he emphasizes things that he's already talked about. He says your sins are forgiven as a result of what? Confession and connection to God. He tells them that, hey, you know God. You know God. How does John know that they know? 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, it's not in the slides. It says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. He says, hey, I know that you know him because I see you're progressing in regards to commandment keeping. And then he says, you have overcome the evil one. How does John know that? Chapter 1, verse 9, it's not in the slides. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all on." righteousness. You see, he wants his readers to be encouraged. He tells them, hey, look, I see the fruit. I see the fruit. You know God. You're in fellowship with God the Father and God the Son. And keep in mind the context. As we talked about with the first sermon in this series, there are people who are leaving. People who once said they believed, but then they deny Jesus as the Christ and Jesus as the Messiah. So we have these people who are leaving, and I imagine there are people who remain are a little bit uncertain, a little bit confused, maybe a little bit scared that, am I going to be like them? And John says, no, you're not. I see the fruit. I see the fruit that you know God. And what's the best and clearest indicator that somebody is indeed in the light, is indeed in relationship with God? Love. Love is the best indicator that someone is connected to God. As we read in verse 10, I'm going to read it again. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. And then verse 8, again, that said, at the same time, it is a new commandment, love, that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and tr the true light is already shining. You see, love is truly in us. Because Jesus entered the world as light. Love is anew and you because Jesus has come down. Jesus has made a change to the world and he makes a change to you. Love is new. Love is new. 
And before we close, again, I know a lot of people here are still hurt uh, by, by things that have happened. I'm not going to talk any specifics, uh, but I know a lot of people are still hurt. Um, and I know that it's difficult to, to maybe not get stuck on past trauma. Um, it takes a long time to heal. But I pray, I pray that the hurt does not get in the way of your love. I know that there have been people who did not love you. I know. I know that you have not been loved in ways that you should have been loved. But don't let that keep you from having Jesus perfect you in his love. Don't let people who don't love you keep you from loving them. And so to close, I just want to pray. I want to pray. Heavenly Father, you know our hearts. You know our deepest desires, our affections. You know what we will. Lord, I ask that you would enter and soften our hearts, that you would change them. Um, And this is something that we can't do. We are helpless, we are hopeless without you. We are stuck in darkness without you, Lord. So I ask that you'd enter our lives, that you'd soften our hearts, that you would change us, that love would not just be something we do, that love would become a part of who we are. And God, I know that a lot of people here, they they still hurt. I ask that you would help them heal. I ask that you would help this church, that we would love everyone that we'd especially love each other, that we'd love our fellow believers, Lord, as we ought. Lord, keep us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, Lord. I pray that you would constantly sanctify us, perfect us in your love, Lord, and that we would love those who even have hurt us, that we would love our enemies. And Lord, we're thankful that this is possible, that we can love as we ought because you have brought a change in us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If love is something that you, you don't even know where, where to go, how to, how to, how to even love, um, Jesus has not left you in the dark. Jesus has not left you in the dark. Love is not something that you, you accomplish by your own willpower. Love is something that's perfected in us by God's will. So you can come, you can believe in him as we stand and sing.